way and control of the U.S. Senate is at stake. So today, President Obama tried to make the case that he and other Democrats deserve credit for the recovery of the U.S. economy. Speaking at Northwestern University, the president rattled off some familiar statistics, like the fact that businesses have created 10 million new jobs in the last four and a half years. And he said, it's, quote, indisputable that the economy is stronger today than when he took office. That is a fact. But here's the problem, and it's one that the president acknowledged. Those economic statistics aren't worth much when many Americans simply don't feel economically secure. Patricia Sabga looks at the reasons for the disconnect. President Obama Thursday walking a fine line on the economy. Our broader economy in the aggregate has come a long way, but the gains of recovery are not yet broadly shared. During a speech in Illinois, the president highlighted the recovering housing, stock, and jobs markets while honing in on one of the economy's most troubling weak spots, wage growth. The median household income in the United States adjusted for inflation was $51,939 last year, 8% lower than 2007. A decline that helps explain the widening gap between rich and poor. Most Americans get the bulk of their income from take-home pay, as opposed to investing in assets like stocks and real estate that have increased substantially in value since the Great Recession. So when wages stagnate or fall behind, so do the majority of Americans. Last year, thanks largely to rising stock prices, the top 3% of American households held more than half of all wealth in the nation, up substantially from 1989. By contrast, the bottom 90% of American households saw their share of total wealth decline nearly 10% in the same period, underscoring an economy that's on the mend, but in which too many Americans are still struggling. Patricia Sabga, Al Jazeera. <clears throat> Former, labor, uh, former Deputy Labor Secretary Seth Harris says that it's not just flat wage growth that's causing the mismatch between kitchen table economics and macroeconomics. Long-term unemployment is hurting the middle class, and both issues could spell trouble for the Democratic Party. Seth served under President Obama from mid-2009 until the beginning of this year, and he joins me now. Seth, good to see you. Thank Thanks. you for being with us. Thanks for having this me. This is a, a weird reality. Uh, this is not even political anymore. People are understanding that measurably the economy is better than it was uh, five years ago. It's better than it was when President Obama was elected. But so much of our economy, uh, so, so much of the population just isn't feeling ahead. That's exactly right. You know, you can't pay your mortgage with GDP growth. You right, need to right. see increases in your paycheck. You need to have a job. And a lot of the American people right now are frustrated that they're not feeling the effects of the economic recovery. The largest share almost 95 percent of the economic growth that's happened since the Great Recession has gone to the top one percent and right. there's a lot of frustration around about uh, in working families that they're not getting that share of the their fair share of the growth. Let me ask you this though, uh, is this an unusual situation where you see a stock market, I know we've had a rough week, but the fact is the stock market's up way over 30 percent in two years, right. okay, less than two years. Uh, housing market, we, we keep hearing it's slowing down, but in fact it's been going up continuously uh, since about 2009. Uh, is it strange that so many Americans are not participating in numbers that would make somebody say this economy is doing okay? It's, it's gotten a lot worse. There's been a break between growth in the economy, including productivity, and workers' wages. Mm -hmm. Workers are not sharing, the overwhelming majority of workers are not sharing in the overall economic growth of the economy. Earnings are up for corporations. Yeah. Profits are up for corporations. They're doing just fine. Their debt is way down. Their earnings to debt ratio is way up. But workers are not seeing it in their paychecks. They're not guaranteed a job. Their, their pensions are, are not mm -hmm. being provided to them by their right. employers. Uh, because of Obamacare, they are going to be able to get health insurance, but it's not coming from their employers. So they're not sharing in the growth. And that's a development over the last several decades right. of stagnant wages, but it's gotten worse since the so Great Recession. So are we bad at, at, at increasing people's wages, or have our jobs just gotten worse? It's partly that the economy, the labor market is quite slack. We yeah. still have millions and millions and millions of people who don't have jobs. When you've got a lot of supply of something, the price doesn't go up, the mm -hmm. price stagnates. But it's also that the way we've structured our economy with very low tax rates on corporations and low tax rates on the wealthiest people in our mm -hmm. country and marginally higher tax rates because of payroll taxes on working families, 
they're not sharing in but the But that growth. was designed, those, those taxes were designed to encourage investment with the thinking that well, those who had money would invest it and, and regular folks would benefit from that investment because companies would grow and expand. What, 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 what happened there? The most important thing that the president said in his speech today was that if trickle-down economics worked, yeah. we would see dramatic growth among middle-class families and working families right now, and we're not seeing it. Because the 1%, top 1%, have done just great. Corporations have done just great. Wall Street has done just great. But that is not turned into the kind of investments that create middle-class jobs. Partly that's a failure of fiscal policy here in Washington, but it's also a, policy, a consequence of the economy being structured in a way that flows a lot of this money into the pockets of the wealthiest people in our society. You know, uh, the World Economic Forum uh, came out with its competitiveness support, and the United States was at number three. But their criticism is that amongst developed countries, our our uh, wage gap, our our, uh, our our wealth gap, is actually growing. The problem that that growing wage gap presents to the economy as a whole is that 70% of our economy is built on consumption. Right. If working families, middle class families don't have enough money to spend, if they can't go down to the grocer, they can't invest in their kids' college education, they can't buy the car, the house, if their house mortgage is underwater and they can't invest in a new one, well then our economy suffers as a consequence of that. And that's what we see because of stagnant wages and income inequality. The president talked about that a little bit today in the context of trying to sell people right. on the success of the Obama economy. Right. But if people aren't feeling it every yeah. day in their lives, it's, it's just not going to be sellable. Uh, is the, what, what, is the, what, what is their best plan? Is, is this uh, increasing the minimum wage to 10 and a quarter an hour logical? Because conservatives are really pushing back on that to say it will cost you jobs, not gain you jobs. So some people get a raise and a lot of people get a pink slip. Right, that's the old canard about the minimum wage. That if you raise the minimum wage, then you throw a bunch of low wage workers out of work. We have natural experiments in our economy where states and localities have raised their minimum wages and the states that have raised their minimum wages have faster job growth than states that have not raised their minimum wages. That, that argument just doesn't work anymore. So raising the minimum wage is a piece of it. The president talked about creating transportation jobs and construction jobs today. Um, Another piece will be assuring that a larger percentage of people get overtime. The president's going after that. There's a whole series of actions he can take, but ultimately, without an aggressive fiscal policy that's investing yeah. in manufacturing, transportation, construction on our economy, we're not going to be able to close the wage gap, and we're not going to help He's people's wages He's put that on the table several times. Republicans will not go for it. No infrastructure bank, no massive infrastructure program in the wake of stimulus. They're, they're not going anywhere near that. There was a time when Republicans were for that's infrastructure right. spending. Right. There was there was a time when they were for transportation yeah. spending. There was a time when everybody got a bridge, everybody yeah. got a road, and everybody came together around these multi-hundred yeah. billion dollar bills yeah. that funded our economy and funded growth, made our economy work better, but we've given there up on that. There was a time when I had hair, Seth. <laughs> And that, that, too, is gone. <laughs> Me, too. Seth Harris is a former deputy U.S. Labor Secretary. Coming up next, Bill Clinton campaigning in Arkansas. The former president is always willing to help Democratic candidates, but this time it is personal. I'll explain. Sunday, an all-new episode. I don't really know what's going to happen to me. Of Oscar winner Alex Gibney's hard-hitting series, Edge of 18. I'm never going to apologize for the type of person that I am. Facing tough challenges. We do feel cheated by the American university process. Taking a stand. It's going to be on my terms on how I want it to be. Boldly pursuing their dreams. What did I do? The lives of American teenagers on the Edge of 18. All-new episode, Sunday, 9 Eastern, only on Al Jazeera America. Ooh, chemical polishes can create a waxy mess. Finally, there's Dutch Glow Amish Wood Milk. Its simple ingredients break down years of wax buildup while easily cleaning and polishing all the woodwork in your home. Dutch Glow's like a magician in the kitchen cleaning cooking grease, fingerprints, and even scuff marks. Did you know most water rings are just a discoloration in the wax buildup and can easily be removed with Dutch Glow? Wow, you can even use Dutch Glow safely on painted wood surfaces like doors and baseboards. Call now and get your bottle of Dutch Glow for just $10. We'll also include a second bottle of Dutch Glow with our special wood floor nozzle. Just pay separate shipping and processing. But if you call right now, we'll even include our jumbo microfiber polishing cloth absolutely free. You get it all, a huge value. Here's how to order. To get two bottles of Dutch Glow for just $10 plus shipping and processing, call 1-800-974-4963 or go to DutchGlow.com right now.
Bill Clinton returning to his roots in Arkansas. America's 42nd president is scheduled to headline four campaign rallies next week in his home state. And this is going to be his sixth trip of this election season. Now, this is all to support Democratic candidates vying for seats in the midterm election. But longtime political observer Blake Rutherford says these so-called pilgrimages aren't just about trying to preserve a bit of blue in an increasingly red state. Uh, Blake says Clinton has some unusually deep ties to the four Democrats who are locked in key races. Blake Rutherford is a political columnist for Arkansas Business, a weekly business journal, and formerly served as general counsel to the Democratic Party of Arkansas. He joins me now from Philadelphia. Blake, good to see you. This is, uh, this is unusual. Bill Clinton has connections to uh, four people running. I, well, not unusual that he has connections to them, but it's almost personal, in fact, starting with the governor's, uh, governor's race. Yeah, I think that's right, Ali. Uh, the governor's race is very unique. Mike Ross, the Democratic candidate, was Bill Clinton's driver during the 1982 gubernatorial campaign, and they've been good friends ever since, political allies. And not too terribly long ago, when President Clinton was in Arkansas, he and uh, Mr. Ross sat down. They had a very long chat about the gubernatorial race and what Mr. Ross ought to do uh, to win. So he's very, very connected uh, both to Mike Ross and to the gubernatorial race. Now, uh, Tom Cotton running for the Republicans has often been referred to as uh, sort of the, the poster child for the perfect conservative candidate today. Tell me about him. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Tom Cotton, who really lived outside of Arkansas for a very long time, came back not too long ago, ran for Congress, and he's really been a darling of the Republican Party. He's got a compelling biography and conservative bona fides, and so he's attracted attention from Republican interest groups, Club for Growth, Americans for Prosperity, and others, and that's really propelled his rise. It's quick. He served one term in Congress, and now he's running for the U.S. Senate. Uh, there's also, uh, the, uh, the, and he's running against Mark Pryor, uh, obviously uh, right. the son of a, of a mentor to Bill Clinton. Well, that's right. And so if you think about the other candidates uh, that are running that have close ties to President Clinton, Mark Pryor's at the very top of the list. Uh, Mark is the son of former U.S. Senator David Pryor, who has been a political ally of President Clinton's for four decades. Uh, the relationship there runs very deep. So certainly Clinton's engagement in that particular race uh, makes a whole lot of sense. And then if you look at two other races, Ali, that are very interesting. One is for uh, the second congressional district, which involves former North Little Rock Mayor Patrick Henry Hayes, who was once a member of the Arkansas Travelers, an influential group that did a great deal to propel Clinton's presidential candidacy in 1992. And then James Lee Witt, who was the director of emergency former FEMA services. Director. Yeah, that's right. Emer emergency services first in Arkansas under Governor Clinton, and then the FEMA right. director when uh, President Clinton went to Washington. So deep ties all around. Let's talk about the economy. Uh, let's let's talk, talk about Benton County, where uh, where Bentonville, uh, uh, Walmart's headquarters uh, sure. is. Uh, they were they were very strong supporters when Bill Clinton ran for president. Last time around, uh, the support has dropped substantially. Uh, what's that about? Right. Well, it's very interesting. I mean, that part of that part of the state, the northwest part of the state, has really become uh, you know a Republican. Uh, haven. There are, there are numerous Republicans who now live in that part of the state. It has a lot to do with economic growth. I think it also has a lot to do with people coming in from out of state to work at Walmart, to work at Tyson, to work at J.B. Hunt, and other economic enterprises that, that really don't bring the traditional democratic values that up until, you know, say 2010, Arkansas was known for. So that transformation has led to a rise uh, in Republican voters in the northwest part of the state, and it really is an influential sector that is driving Republican success statewide. In an in a, in a, uh, election where there are fewer and fewer competitive races, Arkansas is going to be one to watch. Blake, good to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Blake Rutherford is a political columnist with Arkansas Business. Up next, a warning today about our global economy and how building things like bridges might be one way to fix it. Back in the 50s, sod farmers invented hydro seeding as